and welcome to my second lecture on the King's Indian Defense. Um, the King's Indian Defense starts off by uh, d4, knight f6, which prevents white from playing e4, c4, and g6. So white, I mean black, plans on controlling the center with uh, its pieces and then um, and then striking back with pawns. And it plans to put its uh, black plans put its bishop on uh, g7. White plays knight to c3, preparing e4. Black plays bishop to g7. White plays e4, and black plays d6, preventing e5 and freeing the bishop on c8. And then I've already covered the classical variation, which starts off by knight to f3, and the Samish variation, which starts off by f3. And now I want to cover the Averbach variation, which starts off by bishop to e2. So bishop to e2, played for similar reasons as in the classical lines, is that the center is probably going to become clogged, and uh, the bishop will be more useful on e2. And now black castles, somewhat similar. Uh, position, but you're seeing in the classical variation the knight was just on f3. Uh, and now the the move that makes the Averbach the Averbach is bishop to um, g5. Really what this move is doing is that it's um, preventing black from moving its um, e, e5 pawn. Because in most variations you've seen black has m played the move e5. And let's just see what happens if white or black plays e5 or 1. Black plays e5, there's now a pin on the knight. But um, black will actually lose a pawn. And let's just go through the steps. It's not immediate. You're saying, well, gee, I don't see a loss of a pawn in about two or three moves. But here's the actual sequence of moves. So now white takes on d5 or e5, I'm sorry, d takes e5, black takes uh, back, or would lose a pawn, and potentially lose the knight. And now the queen, white plays queen takes queen, or queen takes d8, rook takes back on d8, white plays knight to uh, d5, now threatening to win the knight, because it's attacked twice and only defended once. And also, um, this pawn here is unprotected. This is the pawn that white can win. And so black plays knight on b to d7, and then now if white wanted to, not that white always plays his move, but white could take the pawn if so desired. So that's how you'd win pawn if you played e5 as black. So going back, so white plays bishop to uh, g5, and now um, black will place c5, striking back at the center. So uh, black usually has a goal. It can strike back in the center with e5 or c5. And here it, it uh, opts, or the best move is the c5. And now um, white will advance um, to d5. And now uh, black wants to sort of get rid of that bishop, it's sort of annoying. And in um, many games, black plays h6. Now, while this does get the bishop to move away, it does weaken the king's side. And that pawn now becomes subject to attack. So this pawn here. That's a problem of moving any of your pawns in front of your king, is they become subject to attack. So. The bishop, the best move is for the bishop to retreat to e3, which just backs up to, um, you know, g4. What is it doing? It's really, you know, no no use. Not very active on that square. Now black will play e6, attacking the front of the pawn chain. Um, uh, white plays uh, queen to d2, actually now. Um, threatening to take this pawn here. 
and black will play e takes d5, um, c takes d5, and then now um, black will play rook to e8. And theoretically, um, you know, this pawn for black is under attack, attack twice, defended once. And this pawn here for white is also attacked twice and only defended once. So that is the end of the line for the um, Averbach. So let me back up and cover the four pawns. So I have to move all the way back up to move five. Oops, a little too far. So now we're going to see where white plays um, F4. This looks extremely uh, scary for black. All these pawns there, but uh, should be noted that white has only developed one piece and, the, and made four pawn moves, and pawn moves don't develop pieces. So what black will seek to do is um, open the position, exchange off some of this, some of these pawns. Black has to be play carefully because black could find itself easily crushed in this position. So the next move for black is the castle for king uh, safety here. White will develop a piece. Knight to f3, it's, it's a natural developing square. And now black will attack with um, c5 instead of e5. We'll see why in a move or two. So already black is striking back at these pawns. Um, white will play d5, advancing in the center. Now black will play e6, hitting the front of the pawn chain. And um, white will play bishop to e2. I know I'm going through some of these moves quickly, but we've seen these these moves and other other openings and the reasons behind them are uh, very similar. So bishop to e2, once again, the, probably the most active square for that bishop. And now black will exchange off uh, some of these pawns. So e takes d5, c takes d5. You could ask yourself why not with the e pawn. Well, one, the king's still in the center. And two, capturing the c-pawn brings a pawn in for more central control. Rook to e8. And now um, white advances in the center. And then these two pawns will be exchanged off. And that, bishop, and that um, um, knight is going to have to move. So... So you see white has these two pawns in the center, but they sort of are not, um, you know, they have to be now protected, and as you can tell, they're being attacked from pieces. So black is basically saying, you have pawns in the center, but I'm going to show you that they're weak. And black has managed to get rid of some of this big pawn mass in the center without being crushed. So... Well, that about does it for this lecture. I want to cover one more variation, but I won't be able to do it in the two or one and a half minutes I've left, so I'll continue this in the third lecture.